the introductions very short and let our speakers uh, tell us about themselves. So um, uh, while ju just making sure you're able to share your screen. Yeah. I'll start and I'll, I'll go, okay. Okay, great, now we can see it. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. Serena Breda, who is our first speaker and Serena, take it away. Okay, so thank you so much, Sri and Ari, for inviting me. Uh, this is really, really great. And uh, the, seat, um, the people that give this talk were amazing people. So I'm glad I'm part of this uh, group. And uh, as you can see, I'm not a professor, I'm a doctor. So I'm not, um, I don't work in academia and I work uh, for ABS. I'm an editor for Physical Review E. And on top of that, I also do some research uh, at UPenn. So I still uh, like science and, they, and I still work in science because I mean, being an editor uh, is on the other side of science. And then I'll come back to this uh, at the end. So just to uh, show that there is a possibility out there for scientists that is not just academia. Oh, sorry. So my own town is in the middle of Italy. So over there, where is the red point? And uh, you see stars wherever I've been visiting. So I put the stars to remember the restaurants, the places that I like. And uh, so my own town is really uh, in the middle of the Apennines. Uh, nobody knows about these mountains. They, most of the people know about the Alps and are great for skiing, but there is a, a backbone of Italy. It's basically like uh, the Apennines, the mountains. And I'm really living there. This is my own town, and it's a beautiful medieval village, but it's like up to 3,000 people at most. So you can imagine growing up there, it's not really a lot of fun at such an age. And the only thing that is, uh, sorry, I keep, uh, the only thing that grows there uh, are potatoes because we are like too high. So we don't have olive oil or uh, like, um, or wine, unfortunately, as the rest of Italy. So when I was young, so my parents uh, were young and in love. They didn't probably know what they were doing when they had me and my sister. And they, they are working class people, so they didn't go to college. But they realized soon that uh, in order to, that uh, they needed to give me a uh, stimuli. And uh, so I, I started to, to become a runner. I was a professional athlete. Here you see me passing the uh, baton to my, my friend. And we actually won the Italian championship that year. So that was a great uh, run. And so me and my sister, uh, this is a picture of me and my sister growing up uh, in the mountain. And at that time, I thought that uh, Brooklyn was uh, a brand of chewing gum. And uh, this is the Brooklyn Bridge. And I didn't know that uh, uh, some years later, I was going to leave there. My sister instead became, um, she, um, she went in the army and now she's actually uh, taking care of the logistic of the vaccine distribution. So we both end up um, doing great jobs. So uh, growing up out there, I always wanted to become a scientist. First of all, because I was curious about understanding how things works, but I was really, really bad in storytelling. So I thought that science was uh, definitely my best option. And when I, when I, it was the time to uh, decide what to do, actually, I realized that applied science wasn't my thing, but and when I visited the Department of Physics in Rome, it was really, really great. There were amazing profs teaching QED, and uh, so, and high energy physics, uh, and so that it was really, really uh, nice. But I think that since the beginning, thermodynamics and statistical physics was my real passion. And I think this is my favorite paper uh, about an organization group. So I was really a fan of the organization group during uh, like, um, universities and growing up. And uh, this, I think, is one of my favorite paper. And you can imagine how happy I was when I eventually wrote a paper with Bill on an organization group. So I need to thank him for that because uh, uh, this is actually uh, my success story. So I eventually later became more and more interested in understanding um, biological systems. And, uh, and uh, I think that I met amazing mentors and people that make my scientific career. So that's really uh, something that helps. And in particular, this paper was uh, 
a paper dedicated to the memory of Leo Kadanov. And if some of you know what Leo Kadanov was, basically, he was one of the person really working on the normalization group. So that's the success story. However, however, uh, that was the year that I decided to leave academia. So there were a lot of failures before that and even after. So I have to say that um, I think uh, it's very helpful uh, to share the failures more than the success stories. So first of all, being in the right place with the right people matters. So in, uh, in definitely in Italy, like during my PhD, I didn't really find the right environment to work. And, uh, but the, the good thing is that you, you can prepare yourself because there is gonna be a time in which it's gonna be your turn. And then if you're ready, that's gonna give you a lot of opportunity, open a lot of opportunities. Also, um, fitting in is a really important part. And uh, so people that deviate from the average really a tough time in, um, in, fit, in uh, finding, uh, finding that path. So learn how to communicate properly. This is really important. And I think it's not uh, emphasized enough during your training. So communication is really, really important. So I was very naive when I was young that being not a good storyteller, uh, it was uh, okay for, uh, for, for a scientist. That's not true, actually. That's really part of your job. And it's gonna be even more important if you leave academia. And of course, working in a male dominated field uh, is emotionally draining sometimes. So I keep saying to people to talk about it and to talk to your peers, colleagues, mentors, people that are sensitive about it because it is helpful uh, to be supported. And it doesn't matter if you work in physics or you work outside, it's really a job market is male dominated. So it is gonna be the same everywhere you go, more or less. I have plenty of friends that are not academics, they're not even scientists, and they still have the same issues. So, and lastly, academia is a very competitive place with many talented people and very poorly funded. So facing rejection is part of the deal. So the better and the sooner you realize how to face rejection, the better it is. And on that point, I wanna move on to the fact that there is not only academia, there are many jobs outside. Someone at the beginning was mentioning CDC is hiring models. So there, there is a, a great uh, plethora of possible jobs. Uh, being an editor is one, and we have a job opening. So look it up if you're interested. And the APS is also uh, helping people realizing that there are like currently job manage, and there is currently a lot of opportunities out there. And on the good note is that only 20% of graduate uh, PhD will end up uh, in academia, but only 5% of physics graduates uh, are unemployed. So that means that there are a lot, there is, uh, this is a good time to be a scientist. There are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of startups, there are a lot of uh, tech company that hires uh, physicists for their preparation, their background. And so, so be stay positive and uh, look it up because uh, academia is not the only uh, uh, room for scientists. And last, I want to come back to the issue of communicating science. So as I told you, I thought that it doesn't matter how you communicate, then what really matters is what you do in science, right? But that's not true. That's not true in particular nowadays in which uh, we have plenty of, uh, uh, there is too much information out there. So it's very difficult to uh, screen and evaluate papers correctly. So. Uh, learn how to write papers is really something important, and I think it's uh, it's not really um, taught enough during uh, graduate uh, classes. And if you um, if you want to know more, I think uh, we uh, like we at EPS we're starting to build up uh, a series of uh, all those refree tutorials. That some of them are interactive, so uh, just drop me an email if you're interested and we can actually set it up for your university, for your conference or something. So just briefly, what people, uh, what editors um, look uh, in um, when, when they first seeing a paper is really a few, a few basic points, right? And then they, they ask um, the referees to evaluate them better. But at the beginning, we need to understand what is the research? Why is this research done? What are the open question 
their specific research needs? What are the key results of your paper? The correctness is a little bit difficult to evaluate from the editor, but the impact is definitely important, right? What are the implications of your results? And when, how you convey these five points is really crucial for the success of your paper, not only during the review process, but also later on with other scientists as well. So just, me, just uh, I want to remind you that editors have a first look at the paper and they see dozens per day and uh, they need to be fast and screen it uh, as soon as possible. So the better you write this, the, the higher is the chance that the editor is able to understand what you're writing and direct it to the right people. So with this, I'm done and I don't know how much time it took, so. Excellent, just on time. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, all right, so we have time for a few questions from the audience. If anybody wanna um, raise your hand, I'll try to pay attention. If I don't, you can just unmute yourself. Am I missing? Okay. Uh, There is someone with a, their hand up. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mac Mini One. Oh, hi, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me just quickly, I can't. Oh, you can't change your name. That's the name of my computer. I'm Tim Bylash, actually. My background is medicine and physics. Um, I like to talk. I just, I, just, I could say a lot of things, but I have, one of the things you mentioned was the gender issues. And I'm a board certified OBGYN, but my training is in physics. So I feel like I got it from both worlds and maybe have a little better perspective. I think anybody that's different than what they want at the moment has these problems. And uh, a friend of mine is uh, in the orchestra in Stockholm, a uh, couple I know. And they went to open, they went to uh, blinded uh, auditions because a few years, not too few years ago, they found that women were even better than the men, but were not getting the jobs in orchestras. And I've seen some discussions in some places, but what you wondered what you thought about taking names off of publications when they go for submission to re referees. Well, yeah, that's a big question, actually. And uh, we are thinking about it, the bias, uh, not only um, during the review process, but like more generally, like uh, in science, right? And then citation, citation is also very biased. But like uh, the difficulty for, for us would be to remove, uh, so most of the time, this is the publish on the archive. So it's very easy for the people to find out who the authors are. And so that's, um, so the, the community works in a way that double blind is not really effective, uh, at least for most of the papers that we receive. If the, the authors are not uh, putting that paper on the archive uh, before uh, publication, then that can be uh, obtained. But like so far, we are not thinking about like um, double blind, although there are some biases on the evaluation process if the first order or the last order uh, are women. So, so I agree with you. Uh, ideally, uh, we should do something about it. Hey, thank you, Serena. We have another question from Joe Larkin. You can unmute yourself. Um, a very nice talk. Thank you, Serena. Uh, are, what are the, uh, are there any very typical uh, dishes from your region of Italy, if it's like a very rich region and growing potatoes, like is there, are there any things that come from that region specifically? Well, yeah, we do a lot of things with potatoes, right? Like gnocchi, do you know them <laughs> in particular? And there are like different kinds of pasta. So for, for you, probably it's all called pasta, but for us, the shape, the size, the way you do it, uh, the dough, uh, there are very, very uh, multiple ways of doing it. So in my hometown, there is a specific kind of pasta, it's called sfuselati. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, I mean, they're like basically spaghetti, but like with a hole inside. And they are done with uh, uh, the umbrella, um, uh, it's a piece of uh, iron that you can, can take out from the umbrella, the old ones though, no, not the new one. So that's, uh, that's it. 
All right. Uh, thank you all so much. And I think it's time for us to move to the first uh, breakout session. Uh, Yasmin, if you're... Are 